Welcome back. It is estimated nearly one in three Singaporeans have trouble getting a good night's rest because of a condition called obstructive sleep apnea. Now, this number is much higher than the world average. Yeah, the disorder occurs when muscles in the throat affect breathing during sleep. Now, if untreated, though, it could risk cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, stroke, among others. A treatment option known as hypoglossal nerve st stimulation, or HGNS, that helps to manage weak muscles in the airway through a small implant that's made in the chest. And the device sends a gentle pulse with every breath that's taken. It moves the tongue out of the way and clears the airway and lets patients breathe better during sleep. And for more, we are joined by Dr. Sean Lowe, consultant at the Department of Otorhinolaryngology at Singapore General Hospital. Well, thanks for joining us, uh, Dr. Lowe. Now, first up, we talked about this um, hypoglossal nerve stimulation therapy, or HGNS. Yes. I believe that is actually not new. It's been introduced since 2014. So why are we only introducing uh, this alternative treatment for patients now? So that's a very good point because whenever patients think they're trying on new tech or new forms of treatment, they get a bit hesitant, which is understandable. But it's important to stress that this is not something new. It actually gained US FDA approval, which is not a simple process, back in 2014. Uh, so you fast forward nine years, 40,000 patients have been implanted worldwide. We have more than 150 medical papers that have studied this device. So long story short, you know, this device has been proven to be effective Patients, it's comfortable for patients to use on a nightly basis. It's safe and it's already in its fourth version. So it's not something new that you're putting in your body. Mm. So to answer your question as to why the delay, in, I mean, why, why only arriving in Singapore now? Uh, as doctors entrenched in this field, you know, we don't want to just offer the latest uh, to patients. You know, we want to take an evidence-based approach as seeing whether something is safe and effective before we offer it to our patients. On the side of the implant uh, uh, device side of things, you know, this was really taking off in the Western countries after introduction. So before they wanted to move to another market, they, were, they had to be convinced that the, the country that they want to go into had the local expertise to do the, to, to do the device and the patient's justice. And they found this in Singapore. So, you know, there's a lot of back and forth training required for something like that. Uh, it only made sense after COVID travel restrictions eased. So uh, everything culminated in our implant last year. Our implant team in Singapore General, we did the first implant in Singapore and Southeast Asia. Uh, actually, to date, we are still the only implant team doing it in this region. Uh, in the whole of Asia and Australia, only Japan and Singapore are doing it. And so, you personally did the very first uh, surgery in Southeast Asia to, make, yeah, to do that implant. Yeah, that's right. Me and my implant team. Right. That's right. That's, yeah. a, that's a great achievement, uh, Dr. Lowe. Uh, there are other recommended treatments, yes. of course, CPAP being one of them, and you've brought one of the uh, CPAP devices with you. Yes. Uh, but we have some statistics about that. SGH found that seven in 10 patients uh, reject the use of CPAP because yes. it's the very thing that you said, it's got to be comfortable. People have to feel uh, that it's convenient as well. So how does uh, CPAP stack up against um, the HGNS? Yep. So, so CPAP is still the gold standard. Well, the gold standard meaning to say that it is the first thing that we recommend to patients. We ask patients to try it out first because it's simple, it is non-invasive, doesn't require surgery. But, you know, like, like the stats show, not everyone can sleep with a mask like that attached to the face, connected to a machine. Uh, CPAP works by pumping pressurised air into the airway at night to keep the airway open. Not everyone can sleep with pressurised air in their airway. Right, so... Uh, Although it's very effective, you know, if you look at it overall, the problem with CPAP is compliance. Patients can't use it long enough and they can't use it frequently enough. And I think that's where the strength of this implant comes in. Uh, it, everything is embedded under the skin. Uh, patients just go to sleep and they use a remote and turn the device on. The impulses generated by the device are very gentle, so most patients can tolerate that gentle uh, protrusion of the tongue. Uh, and the studies have shown that up to 90, 85 to 90 percent of patients that previously couldn't use CPAP, can actually get used to this device. Because mm. yeah. I have to admit, just looking at you know, the device, it doesn't look very comfortable. I can't imagine sleeping with it and having to turn around, you know, what sort of, you know, just not so comfortable. But in terms of the cost even, yes. I mean, obviously, uh, sorry, correct me yeah. if I'm wrong, is, is it much cheaper to, to rely on the CPAP? I mean, is cost an issue here? Well, if, if you look at the overall cost, of course, uh, the CPAP device is going to be cheaper. Mm. But without going into the, 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 the specifics of the cost of the device, uh, I'll say that you know, for the patients we've implanted, you know, the amount that they have to co-pay after insurance deductions is actually very in line with the cost of the CPAP machine, mm. depending mm. on what insurance plans they have. 
So if you are interested, you can always uh, come explore this form of treatment. Right. But I mean, just talk us through it briefly. Once it's in there, once yes. you've actually had it implanted, mm. what kind of maintenance is there, if any? Yeah. So once the, I mean, the, the surgery is actually quite straightforward. We do it in about two hours. Uh, the patients can go back the same day. Uh, most patients recover quick, quite quickly and they report minimal pain. We turn on the device about one month after surgery. You know, so we let the patients get used to the device. And once the patients are used to it and using it daily, we bring them back in for a study to make sure that the device is actually working with objective data. Mm. So after that, the patient just has to turn it on every night. Uh, once a year, we'll do a battery check. Uh, the device battery can last about 10 to 12 years. So after about 12 years, you would have to change the device battery. But that said, the, 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 the technical or the difficult part of the surgery is actually laying the wire and connecting the wire to the nerve. Mm. When the battery runs out and you change the battery, it's actually quite simple. You just have to make a small cut over the implant and just change the battery. And it can be done under, under local anesthesia. Mm, right. yeah. So actually, well, well, you know, during this story, right, I mean, some of the stats that I have to highlight being that yeah. about 30% of Singaporeans, they suffer from one form of, of, or another of obstructive sleep uh, apnea, so from yes. moderate to severe, compared to the rest of the, of the world, which averages, I believe, about 6 to 17%. I mean, yeah. why is that the case that, you know, we, we have this, we're predisposed to it? Well, ultimately, anything that narrows the upper airway would predispose to sleep apnea. So it can be small jaw structure, mm -hmm. it can be a lot of fat around the neck coming in to compress on the airway, or it could be soft tissue within the airway blocking it up. So if you compare Caucasian populations, they have bigger jaws than us, you know, they can tolerate a lot more weight gain before it comes in to compress on the airway. Compare this to Asians in Singapore, you know, we have a lot of patients with smaller jaw structures, so, you know, they, only a little bit of weight gain would tip them over into having sleep apnea, which kind of explains why the incidence is quite high in Asian populations. Mm. Yeah. I think whatever it is, it's just good to know that we have all these extra, um, you know, alternative yes. options mm -hmm. for people who um, have uh, sleep apnea problems. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lo, thank for you. being in here in our yes. studio, right. talking to us today. Thank you. And uh, that was Dr. Sean Lo. He is a consultant in the Department of Otorhinolaryngology from SGH.